so this what's the deal of this podcast so hypebeast has a podcast it's been going on already yeah they have like 50 episodes but i'm <laughs> i'm getting my own oh. whole thing oh cool yeah and it, um i'm calling it the business of hype yeah so it's kind of like um talking to people and like you know there's always the conversation of like you should go out there and follow your dreams right, right? but then it's like how, how do I do that? Like, okay, I've done it, but yeah. like, do I need a lawyer now? Do I need like yeah, copy? Agents. Yeah. So I want to like talk to you under the guise of like a young, you know, I, I interviewed a lot of like business owners, brand owners, fashion people, sneaker people, yeah. but I want to talk to you under the guise of like, imagine you're speaking to a young artist right. who's um, like maybe found his, his look. Sure. You know, like, he's not learning art. Like, he knows how to do art now. He has yeah. his look. Yeah. What, do, what do I do now? Yeah. How do I get to your level? And I know there's easily, like, you know, I don't know, 20, 20 years? How many years? Yeah, 20 years. Yeah, so there's, like, 20 years worth of steps in there. Yeah. And what are, like, the hallmarks where it was, like, you know, yeah. the, the biggest learnings? And I'll... I'll Obviously, it'll be conversational. Yeah. So the outcome should be like a kid listening to this yeah. could be like, okay, I've got like a little bit of insight into some some pitfalls I might want to avoid and yeah. some first things that sure. I might need. Yeah. From Hype Beast Radio, I'm Jeff Staple, and this is The Business of Hype, a show about creative entrepreneurs, brand builders, innovators, and the realities behind the dreams they've built. The word artist gets thrown around a lot these days. It's now sort of a catch-all term used to describe anything creative. I mean, you could be a DJ and label yourself an artist. You could be a fashion stylist, a chef, hell, an Instagrammer, and you could call yourself an artist. And there's nothing wrong with that. But everyone should recognize that the roots of the term artist pertains to someone who actually creates works of art. That's putting pencil, pen, and or paint to paper, canvas, or wood to create a piece of art that people can see hold and share that kind of an artist is few and far between and the ones who are highly skilled consistent and can create a massive body of work well they make it to the history books they're the artists your kids will be doing book reports on one day that is assuming book reports are still a thing in the future james jean is your favorite artist's artist because even when the highest paid most hyped successful artists in the world look at james's work they must bow down. His vision, his hand, and his skill is honestly light years ahead of others. It's like he's not from this planet. And for the people who are fans of James's work, they are rabid. I remember one time we held a book signing for James in Reed Space, New York. The line went around the block as though we were dropping a pair of hyped kicks. People waited in line, had something signed, then went back to the back of the line to have something else signed. One woman brought her actual infant child to have signed, like on his forehead. People broke down, they cried. It was a sight to see. James can't even really walk around Comic-Con safely because of the legendary covers he's created. Meanwhile, he's also creating collections with Prada and hobnobbing with the art world's elite like David Cho and Takashi Murakami. But James's path is an interesting one. There is no sneaker collab. There's no Medicom toy. There's no TED Talk, and there's no political vandalism where he defaced a public building. No, James did it his way. And the reason why I really wanted to have him on this episode is because he did it in a way many of you listening might only be capable of doing it. And that is through sheer hard work. Not everyone has all these connections and friends. Not everyone can show up at the right parties and the right gallery openings all the time. 99% of the artists out there have to grind it out all on their lonesome and gain a following one person at a time. To me, there's no wrong way to get your art out there. But in terms of respect, there's not many I respect more than James Jean. So just for the record, let's start with an introduction of who you are and what you do. Uh, My name is James Jean. I'm an artist uh, based in Los Angeles. Um, I paint, I illustrate. Uh, do a variety of things, but uh, take photographs, just all around creative. You know, how long have you been doing this for? Um, 19, 20 years, I think, mm-hmm. from when I first started doing professional work. Okay. But obviously being 
as talented of an artist as you are, you've probably been doing art for much longer than that. Not really. Actually, I, I didn't do art seriously until I went to college. I didn't know I wanted to do art. Well, I, I knew I wanted to do art, but there was really no outlet for it mm -hmm. until I went to college. Mm -hmm. And then that's when it really, you know, blossomed, as they say. Before college, were you already doodling and stuff? Yeah, I was always doodling. I was reading comic books. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I didn't, I think I had like a semester or two of art class. And that was just to prepare my portfolio for art, art school. Mm -hmm. And when I entered school, I was completely unprepared because there were these other kids who had went to art high school and they came in with these crazy, amazing, immaculate portfolios of, you know, pho photorealistic renderings of landscapes and things like that. And I, my portfolio was terrible. Mm -hmm. You were actually like a really dope musician too, right? I was more into music in high school. Yeah. yeah. So all my energies were, were, um, directed to that, uh, but yeah, but somehow I, I just knew I wanted to, to draw and mm. make art. So what was um like your parents' viewpoint on art as a career? Well, uh, yeah, I don't come from an artistic family. My parents didn't know anything about art, and they weren't uh, very uh, excited <laughs> that, that I decided to go to art school. But um, I guess I'm glad that they didn't prevent me from doing that either, mm -hmm. um, and because. You know, I come from like an immigrant family. I felt like this obligation to really prove myself. So I think like by the second year of college, I was paying for everything myself mm. through like scholarships and also um, jobs and um, things like that. And I'd already like gotten rid of a bunch of academic requirements because I um, had good grades and good test scores and all that. And um, so I could just focus fully on the art. Mm -hmm. And um, whatever I did on the side, like uh, I worked at the gallery's office, I had like an internet job and um, I was working like 20 hours a week, making money, paying my rent, which was only like 300 bucks at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I slept on a floor in Brooklyn with like two other guys. Um, and yeah, I, I got these, uh, I, all these scholarships and I was able to, to pay for school. Uh, yeah, like half of the last two years of school were, were fully paid for, so. By scholarships? Uh, yeah. Wait, what school is this? Uh, school of Visual Arts. So you finished college. You're one of the few artists that finished <laughs> school. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't drop out. I didn't drop out. I think, I think you, know, um, you know, I guess I'm full of contradictions because at, uh, at the one end, I'm like very uh, uh, dutiful, you know, like I... Uh, follow all the rules. I'm not rebellious, but on the other hand, I don't like following like the existing paradigm, you know, because at the end of school, everyone's always worried about, okay, how do I get my work out there? How do I become a professional artist? And they tell you all these things. Okay, you got to submit to these annuals. You got to get an agent. Um, you have to like sign up for this, this website um, yeah. with all these other artists. Uh, I think of that. Back then, it was called like the I Spot, and they, they really sold students hard on that. Mm. And um, for some reason, like I was like, you know, fuck all that. I'm not doing that. That, that, that didn't make any sense to me. Mm. It felt old already. Yeah. Um, because at that point, when I graduated, I'd already worked to put together my own website, and that was getting traction on these emerging design blogs. Mm -hmm. And I was getting a lot of response from that already. So just people emailing me saying they, they loved the work and... And, um, you know, my work kind of spreading on the uh, internet um, yeah. through those means. And Because um, uh, maybe you didn't know this at the time, but even though the art world is, like, supposed to be very free and creative, it's right. actually very, like, guarded and, like, rule-centric, and you got to know this and do this, like, allegedly, right? Yeah, it's it's true. There, there are... There's a particular... Uh, grammar to everything that that you're supposed to do even in the painting itself in order for for it to be consumed by the the art world people mm -hmm. you know curators and and um, and other artists and the whole art industry yeah um would you say it's almost formulaic like oh it's you know? it's, it's definitely formulaic and, and i i hate following those formulas i think that that sometimes works against me because i see other artists who follow that formula to a T and it works really well for them. 
of course, uh, it doesn't work for everyone, but, you know, say if you start churning out the same type of work over and over again, you sort of like hit the audience over the head with the same type of thing, like say a particular image or a character, and that is your brand, mm -hmm. that's, that's what you're known for, and you just keep doing it over and over again. Um, well, it's kind of like you have, you have a customer, right? Yeah. And if you know how to play the game to get the customer to buy your stuff, it could be very simple to just churn it out. Right, yeah. It's like making Diet Coke. You know, it needs to taste the same every, yeah. every time. Right. If you walked into a McDonald's and every time you got different tasting chicken nuggets, right. it wouldn't be McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, you know, to me, that, that's not what being an artist is about. And I enjoy uh, experimenting with many different approaches mm -hmm. to making imagery. So I think in the beginning, that was confusing for a lot of people. Um, you know, I... I I did this sort of kind of academic realism uh, earlier in the day and also this more imaginative type of work and sketchbook stuff and digital illustration, traditional painting. And it was all um, uh, kind of this, this uh, uh, amoeba mm -hmm. that no one knew what, what to make of. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were hard to categorize. I was hard to categorize. Right. And then luckily I fell into the only industry <laughs> where, where it seemed like that type of work could exist, which was uh, comic book covers. Mm -hmm. and... Which also is like not desirable by the quote unquote art world. For the art world, right, exactly. Even though a lot of artists now, they steal a lot from comics and the comic world. It's kind of weird that because I did it legitimately, it kind of worked against me for a while. Um, so, uh, this is right out of college. This is right out of college. So, uh, you know, I had sent my book around to all the major publishers in New York and, uh, yeah, no one, uh, responded. <laughs> and what I'd done was, uh, I actually FedExed my, these like handmade portfolios to these hand selected art directors mm -hmm. I had found. And to make sure that they would open up the package and look at Because you would get the FedEx notification exactly, like, that they yeah. received it. Okay. Yeah. Instead of I doing should get like, a reply soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone would, you know, they had to like uh, buy mailers, you know, make postcards and yeah. send them out. That was like the thing to do back then. Um, but uh, You didn't get a reply from I anyone. didn't get, a, well, I got a reply from one children's book publisher. They were kind of interested, but they, they thought my portfolio was a little too strange for them and inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Um, but I visited DC Comics, a friend of mine introduced me to an art director there, and then he saw my sketchbooks, and then from that I think he saw some potential, mm -hmm. and then they offered me uh, the first uh, four or five covers uh, to the series called Fables, and that turned into like a regular gig for seven years. So, As an employee of DC Comics? Um, no, I wasn't an employee, I was a freelancer. For seven years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of covers, but once those first few covers hit, that gave me some legitimacy. So other art directors who were also comic book fans, who worked at other magazines, they hired me to work at those magazines. Mm -hmm. So then that helped my work branch out into other forms. Do you remember some of those early magazines? Um, they were like boring magazines, <laughs> like business magazines. Uh -huh. Um, but those get the right eyeballs. Well, if you're looking to do editorial illustration, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, magazines don't really exist <laughs> now. But back then, that was the, the main uh, bread and butter for a Isn't that crazy that, like, in our lifetime, like, yeah. that industry just doesn't exist anymore? Yeah, I always think of, like, how dangerous it is when you go to school and they tell you how to do certain things. By the time you get out, the world's completely changed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think when you're young, at least when I was young, I felt really kind of stupid in a way for listening to the school. No, no. Just like in general, because I didn't listen to anything, uh -huh. um, because I had really a, a inflated sense of self. <laughs> so I thought I could do everything my own way. Mm -hmm. And it sort of like stumbled around stupidly, like not knowing the exact protocol mm -hmm. on how to do things and, and somehow that worked out because I was kind of following my own instincts yeah like when I was 25 I wanted to publish uh my own art book and back then like that was kind of unheard of mm -hmm. and kind of um that's what dead people do 
Exactly. Yeah. It was like, you're, you're 25, you know, you haven't really done anything. You're so young. Why would you publish your, uh, your sketchbook? Well, my feeling was I'd gotten all this incredible response from the internet at that time. And, uh, but pre Instagram. Oh, definitely pre Instagram. So yeah. what, what do you mean by the internet? Like comments on a blog? No, just emails. And also, I, I did have a blog back then. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And th- my blog, on my blog, I would share uh, my process yeah. on how I would break down how I would make an illustration or an image, like to show the sketch, the, you know, the, the various stages, um, either like a painting stage or like, a, you know, Photoshop layers and things mm-hmm. like that. That's interesting because most artists are very, like, secretive about their process, but you were willing to just show it. Yeah, that, that's part of the the paradox <laughs> of me, where I, I like to cultivate the sense of mystery, but on the other hand, I like to kind of like you know take off the clothing <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and kind of flash everyone with with how everything is done, um, because that I feel like is sometimes more uh, amazing. Yeah, seeing the process and and how it unfolds, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of um, changes along the way that yeah. you might not expect. And um, yeah, the journey is, is always really interesting to, uh, to share with people. And I also think like a lot of artists today, especially modern artists, their process wouldn't be interesting because their process would be like three seconds, you know, like, <laughs> like it's so some art is so simply done. And it's not to say it's not visually interesting or like successful, but it's right. easy to do. I think you have the ability to showcase this process because there are so many like facets and layers sure. to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's sort of showing off. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, painting and drawing is such like a primitive basic thing and it's, it's really magical at the same time. So a lot of contemporary art is, um, you know, a lot of it's like fabricated by a, a fa- factory or a bunch of assistants and um, just being able to draw something with your own hand is still uh, magical to, to experience and to look at. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I like to share that um, or instances of that when I can. Did I hear James correctly? He did two semesters of art in school and that's it? If there was ever an argument that art is a God-given ability, this would be it. As James admits, he is full of contradictions. Excuse the pun, but on one hand, he can paint within the lines, and on the other hand, argue the need for the lines to be printed on paper at all. When he graduated from SVA, he didn't understand why he should follow the normal tactics in getting his work exposed. He was an early adopter to the ways of the internet world, which back then basically meant emailing and blogging, and now he harnesses his massive digital following to showcase analog techniques something that separates him from the pack of contemporary artists today. So you saw this popularity gaining from emails and stuff, and yeah. you just said, I'm going to make a book. Yeah, I felt like I, I should put out a book. This would be a great way to kind of um, uh, legitimize the work even more and to, to get more people to, to, um, to enjoy the work. And uh, yeah, no one wanted to publish it. <laughs> surprise, so I, surprise 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 yeah i got a lot of rejections until um i found a very small publisher in um uh virginia north carolina at house books anyway they, they published graphic novels and uh, after they did my book they did some other art, bo- art books but um and is this after dc this is during during yeah like so this the... yeah this is when i was this was like 2005 okay and uh yeah we made 3,000 copies, and it all sold out. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a demand for it. I knew there was a demand for it, but, you know, the older publishers, they, they, they had no clue. They, they didn't have their finger on the pulse, you know, because mm-hmm. my work was already making their rounds on all the design blogs, and people already knew my stuff. Yeah. Um, and the comic world, obviously. And the comic world, yeah. right. And I had already won all these awards from uh, the comic book industry and a Society of Illustrators and all that stuff. And... Um, yeah, I knew that some books would sell. I didn't know that it would all sell out. And then we did a second printing of 2,000 books, and that sold out too. And then um, we did a, another book. Actually, we did, you know, I, I worked with um, this guy, Chris Pitzer, and we did like two other books. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they all did great. And then the third book, 
I think we sold like 10,000 copies right off the bat to a distributor. And I got like a huge check from, mm. from those sales because actually with the small publisher, I was able to negotiate a very healthy royalty. Because of the success of the first few books, right? Well, sure. Yeah. And I, you know, because I also designed the books, <laughs> basically I, I did. You I, laid it out. Yeah, I laid it. I did all the work, and you know, he helped out with with um, you know working with the the printer and the, the you know the the uh, material um, uh, issues, you know, like paper stock and mm-hmm. binding and all that, which I wasn't too familiar with. And then he also did the uh, warehousing and and uh, distribution. But yeah, essentially, it was all my content. I did all the design, and. Um, yeah, it was way more than any other traditional publisher, even to this day. So now I'm self-publishing again, mm-hmm. because having worked with a major publisher, even though they got my work into, um, you know, a lot of different outlets like traditional bookstores, museum shops, and that sort of thing, like I would make more, way more money by just selling it directly through my own website. So I decided to do that again. Um, so the pro- so the so the pros and cons of major publishing is you get your word and your name out there. Right. But the check is bad. It's very bad. <laughs> it's very bad. <laughs> unless, unless what's very bad? <laughs> well, you know, the royalty rate is between like 6 to 10%, you know, mm-hmm. depending on how you negotiate it. That's that's after they deduct all their costs, you know. And of course, <laughs> as the publisher, they determine what is a cost. Yeah. So in other words, if they want you to go on a tour and go to a city, yeah. that ticket and hotel come out of your fee. Yeah. So what they usually do is they give you an advance against royalties. So if you, you, you always need to negotiate the highest advance possible mm-hmm. because the publisher might not make any money off of your book. They're not counting on making money off, you, off of your book. They're counting on making money off of like a Harry Potter, which is going to fund all the rest of their catalog, mm-hmm. which is going to be full of duds. You know, So they're going to say, oh, we want to publish this artist because they're going to make us look cool. You know, yeah. let's figure out in advance that works. You know, so that maybe they give you, you know, $50,000, $100,000 advance, mm-hmm. even though the book might not sell that much. Right. But you get that all, the, all that money yourself. Mm-hmm. But say if, you know, you made that book on your own and you sold, you know, not, not even as many copies as you would need to make $100,000, like, you know, you could potentially make way more by just selling the book directly because you get all of the profits. Yeah. Um, but you don't, the disadvantage then is you don't get into the right, Barnes you don't and get Nobles in, exactly. and stuff. Yeah. You don't get into, you know, Loma, Loma yeah. and, and, you know. Is that changing now with like the internet and social media? Like will a major distributor like a MoMA or Barnes and Nobles, like will they just hit up artists directly to get books now or work? Just not even books, but... Uh, Man, you're behind it. Barnes and Nobles is like it's dead. I know. Well, <laughs> so now we're, we're we're talking about Amazon. Oh, okay. That's gotcha. that's the where the game is. So they've, uh, um, I've been contacted in the past about like special publishing programs that, that they've explored where they want to commission like special projects that they would especially for them, for them for like special customers and things like that. So, that sounds like they're the publisher now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Amazon. They're, they're going to do everything direct. From what do you call it? It's uh, vertical. It, it's vertical. Yeah. 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 Like pausing right here. You're at DC. You've now made a couple books. Right. Um, some of these have gone to the 10k number in terms of quantities of books. Quantity, yeah. yeah. Right. So, are you um, at this point, from a sort of personal financial standpoint, are you thinking like this is the fucking life? Like I'm. <laughs> like this is amazing right now like you're probably getting good money from dc good money from the books right is life like as good as you could ever dreamed i think professionally yeah at that point um it's going it's going well it's not like i'm not making millions of dollars but yeah it's pretty healthy it's pretty good you're making six figures of dollars oh yeah yes yeah so comfortable and you're an artist exactly so (laughs) you know you wake up with with a purpose and uh you know you work hard to get very competent at that purpose and then you're rewarded for that competency what more could you ask for really a lot of people ask me for the secret to success and i think when people say success they very likely mean financial success 
It's kind of a cliche, but true success or true happiness doesn't really come with money. Money is a byproduct of that. True success is described very simply here by James. You wake up every day, do what you want to do, and make an honest living doing that. There's not much more to it. That to me, that's all you need. You know, if you're not stressing about making rent or things like that. It's... When you first got out of college, were, was there like lean years? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it was cushioned by this internet job I had for a year um, during the, uh, the first... Uh... Porn. <laughs> you're like an internet job uh, no I was, I was the opposite I was making children's animation <laughs> oh I feel gross now yeah. Um, yeah then the internet bubble burst I think that was like 2000 2001 and um, uh, I was stupid I, I, I quit the job because I wanted to focus my last semester of school on my portfolio I should have just stayed on and then I could have gotten uh, unemployment checks which my friends collected. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to like nip it in the bud and get out as fast as I could. Um, cause there's just way too much like going to school and then, um, working like 20, 25 hours a week. Um, but the money was pretty good. And then when I graduated, um, yeah, the, you know, I pretty much got that DC gig right off the bat, but still, you know, that, that wasn't that much money. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, yeah, it took a few years, which I think is also pretty fast, actually, where I was, you know. Like, you weren't doing covers right from the get of DC, right? I was, yeah. Wow, your first thing was like, here, do this cover of Fable? Yeah, for for uh, Vertigo. And at that point, they paid, um, they paid decently for their covers, mm -hmm. especially compared to um, uh, other companies. <laughs> because uh, Vertigo's whole thing was that they they published fiction, not comics, so they had like a more elevated mm -hmm. kind of pay scale. Yeah. Um, so can yeah, give, really, I mean, can you give us an idea like back then what was like the cover? Oh, back then it was like two thousand. So. Wow, it seems low. Well, that was like, almost twenty years ago. Right. And <laughs> As inflation. Yeah. And the sad thing is those rates haven't gone up. <laughs> okay. So Not inflation, just yeah, cheap. yeah. Yeah. So if you if you're like an illustrator starting out, you should know that the rates haven't gone up in like 15, 20 years. We talked about um editorial illustration, like yeah. for magazines. That's like basically That's free. Yeah. It's like you'd it's be lucky hard. to get your name credited in the margin. Yeah. yeah. It's terrible. So like in two thousand seven, that's when I stopped doing all of that. So, 10 years ago. Yeah. I remember I was like art directing magazines. Yeah. So, we'd be working with illustrators. And I'd be like, what's the budget to pay the illustrator? Budget? <laughs> budget. <right? laughs> Literally? That would be the answer. Like, budget? Yeah, there's no respect. We're, we're putting their name in our magazine. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you're commissioning a visionary to create this unique piece of <laughs> original artwork for the magazine. But yeah, there's no respect. So that's where, if I do a commercial project these days, it's on a totally different type of arrangement where, you know, they come to me because of what I'm known for in my audience. So I'm only doing commercial stuff if it's like um, for like a relatively large like advertising type of job, mm -hmm. which I guess is still considered illustration. But, um, but yeah, the budgets are way, way higher. Yeah. So. Because they're not using you as like a production person and just right. do this. They're using your name. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, I, I asked that question about how you felt like you were doing and you said like you're doing really well. You're waking up, fulfilling your life, making a good six figures. Yeah. Did you think this was the glass ceiling or did you think there's more? Oh, there's, <laughs> there's always more, which is the problem. So um, no, I mean, I try to keep my expectations um, I don't know what's it like, not realistic, but I focus on the work Yeah. and I focus on how can I make the work better and how can I get the, get the work out there in a more effective way. Uh -huh. And that equates to the business side mm -hmm. of it, you yeah. know, like how to do social media, what projects to take on and things like that. Right. Be selective about, about what to do and um were you seeing contemporaries that you were like yeah like what he or she is doing like that's where i want to be uh sure yeah like, yeah who were definitely those back, then? back then um so i'm thinking this is like as you're 
sort of leaving DC, like the tail yeah. end of DC. Yeah, right. So that was, oh yeah, I would say, yeah, back then there, you know, say people like uh, Mark Ryden, mm-hmm. he was doing really well. You know, he had also done illustration when he had graduated from Art Center. And then, um, you know, he started doing his own painting and then, um, yeah, he, you know, got on the cover of Juxtapose and um, sort of became the center of this new art movement. And um, yeah, he was just, he would craft these amazing paintings and the value of these paintings would keep going up uh, after each successive show. And um, yeah, I would say that uh, what he was doing was sort of a good model. And he, he also would design these very beautiful um, objects like books and uh, postcard sets and all these mm-hmm. types of things. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel, I feel like that was a, um, uh, definitely a level above me. Yeah. You know, something that I was hoping to develop. And uh, yeah, I had my first gallery show 2008. How long after DC? Uh, about a year. Okay. Yeah. So prior to that, you weren't really selling work yet. I was selling work actually. Uh, I was I was selling. Uh, it turns out there's a huge collector base for, um, the comic book work. Okay. And so I was able to get a gauge of, um, the market. Yeah. And I I also sold some stuff on eBay. Uh, <laughs> back in the day, yeah. Crazy. So. You know, I would put something on that I knew would do well and it'd go up to, you know, 10,000, 15,000. I was oh. like, oh, okay, it's, you know, this is sort of a good sign that there's a healthy competitive market for some of this stuff. And, um, and I would sell a lot of stuff directly too, just like sketches and drawings and paintings that I would do for professional work. And um, I had done, you know, done some personal work, but that, at that point it was only like 20, 30%. So was DC cool with you doing that? With the personal work? Like you were taking work that you were doing for DC. Oh, and selling. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Because uh, that's how a lot of artists um, supplemented oh, okay. their income. So you get paid shitty for doing the cover, but then you could make money at right. You, you could exactly, yeah, stuff. yeah. You could make way. Well, you can't sell prints of the uh, the covers. Oh, okay. But uh, <laughs> but um, but you can sell. Like, yeah, the original work would would sell for way more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so where was I going to go with that? Oh, so yeah, 2007, I just come off big project with Prada. Yeah. So uh, I felt like that was a really good time to exit and then just focus purely on my personal painting. Mm-hmm. And um, how did Prada hit you up? How does that happen? Um, well, <laughs> first of all, I'm really bad at networking, I think. Mm-hmm. I feel like there are people who like put in a lot of... FaceTime and plant seeds. They plant seeds, many seeds. Uh, they go to the openings, and that I I tend to stay indoors. But yeah, for uh, those who are listening, like when we say planting seeds, it's like when you go to all the right cocktail parties and functions and openings, and you you know there's that guy that's like shaking every hand, having thirty five tiny conversations with many people all night long, and you know, they follow up and it's like, it's, it's, to me, it's like a skill if someone has that ability to, to network. Um, but it really takes time and effort. Yes. Cause you know, then obviously you're out drinking with them and then the next day you're hung over and then you can't like, you know, it's, there's only 24 hours in a day. And if you spend like eight hours a day networking, that's eight hours that you're not actually creating work. So my strategy was to make the work as good as possible and have people just come to me so <laughs> because I, you knew you didn't want to network <laughs> exactly i don't do well networking because uh you know i'm a uh, diminutive asian man <laughs> who kind of gets overlooked when i'm at you know like a, a loft party in brooklyn or something like that so uh yeah i stayed indoors i, I focused on the work and try to get it to a transcendent level and i think through most of my career i've been mostly passive <laughs> in terms of, you know, a lot of the big projects that have come my way. So with the Prada thing, um, a friend of mine, Eric White, this painter from, uh, from Brooklyn at the time, he moved to LA, but uh, he had done the previous wallpaper installation for the store in Soho. And uh, the design company that was looking to create the following 
mural installation was looking for like a you know a graphic novelist type of person mm-hmm. and Eric recommended me even though I didn't do graphic novels I didn't draw comics <laughs> but somehow because I had worked on comic book covers like I was the guy so mm-hmm. um, yeah we worked on a concept but it didn't work out and then um, and this was just for the one store this was just for the one store yeah okay. and so it's not really at this point it's not like a full on collab with Prada it's like no, not at all. visual merchandising really yeah yeah, yeah exactly and um, uh, the initial uh, pitch for the the mural didn't work out. It got rejected. Okay. Not my pitch. It was the pitch from the design company. They wanted me to do a very specific thing, mm-hmm. and um, which is funny because actually that turned into what we just did this year. <laughs> ten years ten later. Years later. <laughs> so you're only ten years ahead of the curve. Exactly. Right? So, so they asked you for the specific thing. You did it, and they rejected it. Yeah, so the design company pitched it to Mrs. Prada. Mrs. Prada had said, no, I'm not into it. Why don't we try something like romantic, sci-fi, non-linear? And um, I was like, oh, perfect, that's me. So I submitted my, <laughs> like, all of these ideas I had, and that's what we went with. And uh-huh. then after that was done, they said, oh, wh- wh- let's try and do another wallpaper for the Milan fashion show. So I started sketching that out, and they are like, oh, uh, we tried putting on the clothing. It, would that be okay? I was like... You know, sure, of course, let's let's do it. And kept on like renegotiating the contract, and then, um, yeah, then kind of snowballed into this like kind of season long whole collection. Whole right? collection did animation. They like turned into environmental graphics, and um, uh, yeah, I, th- I think I read an article in Vanity Fair that said it was like the most profitable year ever. They made like bags and shoes and everything. Do you feel? Um you were paid accordingly? <laughs> I could commensurate to what yeah. the profits they made. Um, no, but uh, I was paid well. But, uh, you know, the prestige of working with them was definitely extremely valuable. Yeah. Uh, at the time, they didn't really work with me as like a marquee artist, mm-hmm. say like Louis Vuitton or Takashi Murakami. But, um, you know, they also have like a different relationship with, you know, the people that they collaborate with because yeah. it's, it's all like Mrs. Prada's kind of right. vision. They're less like collab X. Exactly, X. exactly. Yeah. They Philosophically, they don't want to be like that, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't want to speak for them, but, you know, I think I've read that she's definitely wants to separate art from fashion, even though they do support a lot of the art and architecture and they, uh, you know, they have the, the Prada Fondazione and all of that, but the fashion stuff, the commercial stuff is, is meant to support all the art stuff. So mm-hmm. if I do art for the fashion, that's sort of not seen as like art, you yeah. know? Um, this is a common thing that I hear amongst creatives when they work with a big corporation. And this is when it goes well, like they do project a and it does well. Yeah. And the company's like, Oh great. Let's add a and B together. Okay. We'll do B. Oh, that was awesome. Let's do C. And like, it starts spinning yeah. fast, yeah. right? And the creative has to sort of keep up with that or else they might get taken advantage of. Like all of a sudden you see your stuff, like you said, it's like all over clothes, handbags. If you're not on top of that, let's call it a negotiation, right. you could have been billing for a wall in Soho, yeah. but then it ends up on every handbag in the showroom, right? Right. Yeah. No, everything needs to be like spelled out. In the contract. And are you very good or were you at that time really good at being like, hold hold up the line right now. We got to renegotiate this contract. Uh, no, I, I didn't have to do They They were proactive in okay. doing that. Yeah. So they're good, honest people. Yeah, I think so. Because it's, it's actually as big as Prada seems. The team is very small, mm. very tiny. And, you know, 10 years out, it's a lot of the same people. Nice. Still, yeah. so it's really like a family business. Very family business, and this time I actually went to Mrs. Prada's house and we had dinner and stuff. So it was, yeah, it was, it was very nice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she invited only the closest collaborators that she's worked with over the years. It's all the same people. It's really incredible. But That's dope. yeah, so it's ten years later you're working with them again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything comes full circle now. Like I'm gonna have my. I've only had like a few gallery shows, even <laughs> even though that's like my main focus, but. Um, yeah, going to have another show soon in April um, at uh, Kai Kai Kiki Gallery. Mm-hmm. Takashi Murakami's gallery, right? Yeah. 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 So going back to that time where like you left DC, you did the Prada project, um, 
I think that's when you started to try to focus on fine art. Right, yes. Right. And, and really like removing yourself from the comic pigeonhole or, and the collabo artist pigeonhole. Like, right, you wanted to just be like yeah, yeah, James be Jean, fine artist, painter. Yeah. Period. Full uh-huh. stop. Nothing else. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. How did that? How did that journey go? Uh, it was rough. It was rough. <laughs> uh, what? What happened? Why was it rough? Well, I feel like it's really interesting. Uh, as I'm older now, I, I feel like, like, like I was talking about being following your stupidity earlier. When you're younger, you don't know exactly what you're doing. You're kind of following your intuition, and that takes you in certain directions. But then once you become too intentional. Uh, that's when things kind of start screwing up mm. for you, you know? What do you mean by too intentional? Like, okay, I'm going to... Oh, too strategic. S- too right. strategic, right. yes, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Um, you know, you like write up a plan. I mean, I didn't write up a plan, but like I had, that, had this, okay, I'm going to do these paintings. I'm going to, you know, have these studio visits. I'm going to try and get these gallery shows, show at only these specific galleries. And, um, and this goes into what we were talking about before, about like the sort of, paradigm rules of the art world right so you look you sort of said these are the rules and i'm going to play this game yeah yeah it's it's really funny because it 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 worked out the opposite of what i thought so i thought i was trying to do these more serious paintings and that they were uh you know more expressive and more abstract and and this was stuff i wasn't actually interested in, in doing and um Somehow, I was able to get a lot of very serious galleries to visit my studio and to look at the work. But then when they saw it, they were like, oh, we like the earlier work, <laughs> the more illustrative, you know, surreal uh, work. And I was like, what the fuck? I thought that was the opposite of what you guys wanted. Because, <laughs> you know, at the time, people were, you know, there was like kind of a big divide between like the proper art world and juxtaposey type stuff, you know, this, the, that world where it's like uh, more uh, lowbrow, I would say, you know, the, mm. what people would say. And then um, sort of like <clears throat> much more fantasy driven. Is that what you mean? Like that? Yeah. yeah so complex, yeah. like. To like more, I would say, um, yeah, stuff that's like very narrative driven, very literal, yeah. kind of um, focused on technique. A lot, you know, technique is kind of really looked down upon. And that is what you're saying was the juxtaposed yeah, quote juxtaposed unquote, world. world. And the art world didn't want anything to do with that, is what you thought. As is what I assumed. Yeah. But I was completely wrong. The art world just wants work that they can sell. sell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So they have their stable of artists. So their strategy is they're gonna they have some artists who are super serious artists, you know, conceptual artists um, who do work that's very challenging and um, is a champion by, you know, intellectuals, curators, museums, and then they have. And they they don't. They don't really make money, right? No. So okay. Those artists, artists don't make money. Which is, you know, they're looking for their Harry Potter, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's all the same. So, right. um, yeah, they they looked at me as someone who could potentially um, make the money because I had a big audience at the time and. Um, I mean, now it's even bigger, but yeah, at the time it was considered, I was still considered like popular oh, artist. Yeah. And, um, and the, the fact that they sort of said, like, we don't need you to be the conceptual guy. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's not your decision to make. That's their decision, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, we need you to ring our bank account, not <laughs> be, not get art critics to like laud you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of reinforced my feeling of being independent mm-hmm. again. Doing it again your own yeah. way. So even with working with Takashi Murakami, he, we have the same types of conversations. Because he's saying, he's like, well, you know, are you sure you want to be in this world? You're going to lose a lot of freedom. Even if you, if you work with you know, the, the top-end galleries, you know, Gogosian, Emmanuel Peritan, and you know, all these... Uh, Blum and Poe, you know, there are a lot of shenanigans <laughs> that go on. And um, uh, that's why it's great working with Murakami is because, uh, uh, you know, he's another artist mm-hmm. and I could do whatever I want. There's no expectations. There's no, um, I'm still independent, even though, you know, there's expectations of 
you know, us doing certain things together, but still that relationship is not as, I would say, um, intense as mm -hmm. like a traditional gallery artist sort of representation yeah. type of arrangement. Are you officially part of his gallery? Are you part of Kaikiki? I guess. I don't know. I, I just, um, no, I'm not actually. Cause he, he fully supports, um, a few artists. Mm -hmm. So there's like Mr. Yeah. And, um, this young girl, OB. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has her studio in his yeah. factory and right. he supported her ever since she was like, I don't know, super young, 16, 17, something like that. Um, so those artists are, you know, more, they have a tighter relationship. He actually <laughs> goes in and, um, he'll make like corrections. <laughs> it's like teacher student. <laughs> I mean, basically, yeah, he, he, he has a real mentor, uh, mentorship type of relationship with those artists um uh matt saki is a recent one oh, so you've that. seen his work yeah right? of course yeah so they've done like some collabs together he's gotten him into emmanuel peritan gallery and um yeah they there's this definite um relationship there where he is the mentor mm -hmm. and he kind of has uh a bit more of a say yeah and uh, guidance. He provides a lot of guidance. And how about your relationship with the, the him or the gallery? Zero guidance. <laughs> Zero guidance. Just, but what do you get out of it? Friendship. Friendship. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I get a venue to show my work at. We don't, okay. have, we don't have that type of relationship. Where, like, uh, I know some of the artists, they'll, they'll need to update him with the work, and then he'll respond with, "No, you need to, you know, like, yeah, yeah. fix this or right. do that differently." Or okay. so you're not you're not signed to Kaikiki. You're not a part of Kaikiki. No, yeah, he, do, he doesn't he doesn't give me a stipend or, or pay me any money. Right. Yeah. Whereas these other artists, maybe he'll support them for like studio costs and things yeah. like that. So. Right. Yeah. And how do you meet Murakami? It's really weird because, like, you know, with a lot of the stuff that's happened to me, I've always had this thought, like, okay, I would love to work with you know, this company or meet this artist and it always happens. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, what do you call it? It's like the secret. Or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I subscribe to that, but it's just like, you know, I have this thought, Oh, it'd be nice to do that one day. And then sort of, you know, I'm not like actively chasing it, but it kind of happens. Like with Murakami, I went to an art fair, at Hong Kong, um, art HK. I wonder if that was the first time. I think we were talking about how, how crappy my memory is, but uh, uh, no, I think one of the first times was I ran to him in Hong Kong. No, no, that was the second time. So I think the first time he was actually brought to my studio because I worked with this Japanese company mm -hmm. and they were working with him at the time on something. And then their office was part of this big warehouse that I was sharing with uh, David Cho. And then, yeah, Murakami came by. And at, at that time, he was very quiet. He like didn't like to speak English. Yeah. And so he had like a translator with him. Even though he could speak English. I feel like his English got a lot better. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He probably wasn't as confident. He could probably understand a lot, but he wasn't confident in talking. And which is amazing because now he does all the talking. It's like this crazy transformation. But um, yeah, this translator is just like sitting there quietly like next to him. And then occasionally he'll like help define a word or help him like find, find a word that he's searching for. But um, were you ready for him when he came to the studio that first time? Oh, no, not, not at all. Like, I don't think there was any, any interest. I mean, no, that was like 2010. Uh -huh. And then I ran into him, I think, yeah, that same year at uh, Art HK. But wait, when he came to the studio, was, was it already like, you already said to yourself, I want to meet Takashi Murakami? Yeah. And he came. Yeah. But you're like, I'm not worthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because when I was even when I was living in New York, I knew about. I mean, he he was already um, like a major uh, artist yeah. in two thousand, and you know, my I knew people who who worked for him because mm -hmm. he had like a painting studio in New York, and at that time everything was hand painted. Uh, I remember uh, my friend saying, "Oh, the water needs to be specially filtered for the paint, acrylic paint." Yeah, and um, you know they worked like. Uh, horizontally with the painting flat and everyone was just like uh, laboring over this painting with this like uh, crazy filtered water and when you when he left were you like well that sucked <laughs> like <laughs> yeah I mean it's always kind of like that yeah. right when you meet that's why I never want to meet anyone because you, you don't want to meet your heroes you kind of mm -hmm. kind of um, but 
Yeah, just over the years, we kind of had like a on again, off again <laughs> type of relationship. But um, no, he, it turned out he was uh, he was interested in my work for a long time, but he kind of stayed away because he thought this other Japanese company that I worked with a lot um, was sort of like representing me, even though they weren't. So he sort of like, you know, respected that. Respectful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, once we we met uh, again a few years ago and um, yeah, basically went to his cafe in Tokyo and his staff told him I was there and then he showed up, He, he came out. And um, yeah, and then we had a long chat. And then since then, we've had many, many talks. I've visited his studio. He's always super gracious. And um, he came by my house recently here. And he took a lot of photos, but he didn't say much about the work. Um, also, I think he's trying to be respectful, too. Because, um, you know, he, he invites a lot of international artists to show at his gallery. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some are, uh, you know, st- still represented by by other major galleries, but... Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a different relationship that he has with his own Japanese artist that he supports. Um, but, um, yeah, I was, I, I mean, yeah, actually, if I think about it, this is sort of like the culmination of like many, like, uh, thoughts that I've had about kind of, um, meeting him. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. For a lot of creatives, getting a break or getting put on by one of your idols is a very big deal. It probably doesn't do a whole lot for your wallet, but it's great to have that validation. When you've looked up to someone while honing your craft, and then you get to the point where that person recognizes what you're doing, that's an amazing feeling. A lot of people think it comes from luck, being at the right place at the right time. And while stories like that do happen, hey, winning lottery tickets also happen, instead of waiting around for that, develop your craft and your vision and make them take notice of you. And you know, same with Prada. It's like, oh, I would love to work with Prada. I think at 10 years ago, uh, they're probably like my number one based on like their aesthetic and um, you know, what they're doing, the architecture and everything. It just seemed like that they were at the top and it seems so out of reach. Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, it's just incredible that, that it actually happened. And again. Yeah, and then like, I was, I always had this, oh, it'd be great to work with and then, and then it happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I helped launch the. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the <laughs> thing. I don't think I can talk about it. It has to be off the record. Sorry, <laughs> I signed a contract. I can't talk about any. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to go back to the uh, when you started to tr- try to get into like the art world, right? Yeah. And you tried to get artists like gallery representation. I'm sure. How yeah. long did you? give that before you sort of decided to do something else? Yeah. uh, You know, I always had this thought, okay, I'll give it four years because, you know, a lot happens in four years. Like you go to art school, it takes four years, (laughs) you know, like the 10,000 hours of practice at any kind of new endeavor is like three to four years. Um, and yeah, the four years passed and nothing like really great happened. Meaning like you didn't get a gallery show. You didn't get signed by one of the yeah. top galleries. Right. Yeah. Were you selling more art? I was still selling art. I mean, financially on, on my own. Yeah, directly. Yeah. Which actually now is, is the best. <laughs> yeah. And which I've, you know, I've discussed with other people. Yeah. It's the, the, the only problem is uh, not being able to show the work because if you're doing the work and selling directly no one's going to see it you know i mean they see it online they see it on instagram or on your website isn't that enough now um it was enough for me but now i I do want to have people look experience the original work because they get a sense of you know the scale of the work and the, the colors and and you think that can only happen in a gallery yeah well you know how else are you gonna see a work in person unless it's in a museum that's like the only other context uh couldn't you open your own gallery i could it's it's possible yeah 
Yeah. And I've, I've had that thought too, where it's like, okay. Yeah, if you're talking I, about vertical, like right. just really have my vertical. own storefront, I can have all my products and maybe show like one painting a month there, mm-hmm. like the painting that I'm working on at the time. Have like a workshop space in the back, invite people over. Um, yeah, that's something I've always thought about, but it's just uh, a lot of work. <laughs> you know, having a separate space and maybe I'll need to, you know, hire more people. I'm like, I like to keep every the operation very lean. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't like having a lot of stuff or mm-hmm. having to be responsible for a lot of stuff, which is paradoxical because I make stuff and I sell stuff to people. So yeah. um, it actually gives me a lot of anxiety. But um, but I get it. You don't want like rent, payroll, exactly. like yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it was getting to that point. So now, like say with my web store, I have someone else take care of that completely. So... I don't see any of the customer service emails or any of that taxes, payroll. This guy handles all of that for me. Mm. Um, So I used to actually do that all myself. That's crazy. Well, I mean, I I did have what what do you call like a a business manager? You know how like a lot of creative people, um, celebrities, whatever, they have like what they call a business manager. Uh Basically, it's like a company that does everything for you. They like baby you. They like change your diaper. You know, they pay all your bills. Uh, they do all your taxes. Uh, in exchange, you give them, you know, three to 5% of your income. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had that for a while and it was, you know, like a, a very um, a pleasant thing to, <laughs> to have because I didn't have to need to worry about anything. You know, they buy your insurance. They can negotiate car lease, all that stuff, like anything financial, they, they take care of. Mm-hmm. And they also handled like payroll stuff for me. I had minimal payroll. I only had like uh, two or three people working for me at, at any time. Um, but I had my web store in my house and I'd like order supplies for you know, shipping supplies and worry about my printer and all that stuff. Customer service. All through you. All through me. Yeah. So now that all that is offsite now, and now I focus um, hundred percent on, on uh, the work. So when I have assistants, they're helping me with the work, mm-hmm. not, uh, not packing, packing. Yeah. yeah. Do you still work with that company that handles all your affairs? No, now, now I've pared it down even now I do a lot of it through my accountant. Mm-hmm. So just super simple stuff. It, it's it actually, is not that much work. So, you know, those business management companies, they're making a ton of money yeah. off of something that they're just like plugging into a software. Right. You know? And it gets, you get spoiled up by it too. Like all of a sudden, like you can't even book a flight anymore. Like. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, wait, I know how to book a flight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's horrible. Right. Um, this part is pretty interesting from James. He gave himself four years to figure out if the traditional gallery paradigm would work for him. Four years seemed like a good number. College, presidents, Olympics, they're all four years. Why not art? And from there, he would decide if he would switch it up. At this time, he also dramatically pared down his support staff. From all the different people I've talked to, some are completely on their own, some oversee hundreds of people, but it's important to have your own cadence. Understand your own flow. Forget about what you're supposed to look like. Set up the working environment that makes you feel most comfortable because that's where you'll be able to perform at your best. So now, sort of fast forward to today, you know, you have different forms of income. Yeah. Right? You multiple. S- multiple channels. Can you like break down like your pie chart of sure. how you make um, money? I think generally... Uh, a third of it is print sales, um, publishing sales, mm-hmm. which you do, um, sort of like you almost do it on like a flash type limited basis, right? All right. We, yeah, we, we do these timed print sales where we'll release a print for 24 hours only, and we'll only make as many prints that are ordered in that time frame. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's worked out great because there's no waste. Yeah. You know, you're not like making too much inventory. You're sending right. exactly to the, the amount of people that want it. And exactly. it's still, um, it's still limited because of the 24 hour window. So people do miss out and, yeah. you know, 
very strict about that. But it's not so limited, like where it's 10, where exactly. no one gets it. So it's a yeah. good balance. It's a good balance. Yeah. And occasionally we'll do like a super limited release and those will sell out in like a, a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to have like a balance of that. So a third is that prints. Yeah. yeah. And then a third is say original art sales. And paintings. Then paintings and sketches, drawings. And then uh, another third is special projects. Mm. So Prada, stuff like exactly. That. Yeah. And every year there's, you know, like alcohol brand or something, something will come up. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, um, that, that second category you said, which was like the paintings, yeah. is that including commissioned pieces? Yeah. Okay. Are you still taking commissions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm backed up. So, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, I handle all that personally. So it's, uh, on a case by case basis. And some commissions are really big. Some are, smaller um yeah but generally nothing less than uh, you know i want to make sure it's a sizable commission so i'm not spending too much <laughs> of, of my of my year on on something yeah um that's not uh but without representation how are the commissions coming to you uh just just email yeah or and, and also into the dms <laughs> Well, yeah, referrals, uh, you know, one collector will have another friend who's interested or, uh -huh. you know, I'll hear about yeah, another friend um, will know like a prominent family there. They want something for their new house and then they'll, their friends will be interested in something. So, yeah. yeah. What's the wait time right now for a James Jean piece? Uh, well, it's actually really bad because uh, I'm working on this show for Kai Kai Kiki. So I think it's, it's like eight months <laughs> so after I'm, I'm, I'm planning to finish the show end of February and then I'll I'll get back to um, the commissions that, that I've been waiting for yeah you know, the past year so mm -hmm. do they uh, like how do payments work like do they prepay deposits yeah, it's, it's a 50% down and uh -huh. a 50% upon uh, delivery and they know that when they pay 50% they have might be waiting a year yeah but by then it might be worth more so I, you know it's kind of locking in a price so that's true. You could look at it that way. You could also die. Yeah, <laughs> no, I would, yeah. But then if I make a really cool piece, so what's great is um, some of these commissions turn out to be um, really popular pieces when I post them online, and then I'll do a print release, and then that'll do really well. And then so it's like just, mm -hmm. you know. And that's written into your deal. Like you can still take their painting and make it into a print. Yeah. 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 And I think generally. Um, uh, that's a good thing. It kind of like makes the painting more important, the original more important. That way. I see, yeah. right? It makes it more popular, more, which makes the original more recognizable. More yeah. yeah, and then you're like, oh shit, that's the you know the original painting. True. Yeah, my friend with the print on the wall, and you have the original. Whoa. Right. Yeah. Are your hands insured? Uh, they are. Yeah, actually, uh, I have disability insurance through Lloyd's. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which is hard to get for so disability insurance is hard to get for an artist so um, yeah so for yeah I'm prepaid up to five years and then after five years we have to you know re-examine <laughs> me but um, examine your hands well not well, my hands just just everything it's like it's not just the hands it's anything you know like yeah but, yeah well so what we're talking about here you know if to I the listeners it. if you get a paper cut that's really bad <laughs> you might not be able to work for a month right yeah. right like. Hands, I get what you mean, like mental, heart, lungs, it all affects yeah. your ability to work. Right. But like, if you just slam your car door on your finger... Yeah, if you, I can't work, yeah. yeah I can, I you're fucked. Claim, yeah. Okay, so you got insurance on your hands. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you're like a hand model. <laughs> yeah, so look, look how ugly this, that, that bump is on my finger. <laughs> that's the callus that's from the ca yeah. just yeah. holding a paper. Oh my holding god! Yeah. It's, it's gotten super crazy <laughs> this last year. I mean, I know this is a podcast, but like, I'm looking at, it looks like the size of a big P. It looks like Quato from uh, Total Recall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just there permanently, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It, there's no, it's not fluid. It's all right. solid. It's, like, it's solid. <laughs> it's almost bone at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Just to wind up now, like, I'm sure you get this from a lot of young artists who, who hit you up as well, but like... When, when a young artist asks you for advice, what is sort of like the, the one takeaway you want them to have? Um, yeah, to, you have to be diligent. You, you have to keep making the work 
and focusing on making the best work possible. So, you sound like such an Asian dad right now. That was like... I'm, I've turned into an Asian dad. <laughs> that could have been like... I, I could have been asking you about like math. And you're like, it's just, true. just yeah. be diligent, son. <laughs> and do your best work. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, yeah, if you worry about all the other stuff, uh, it's not going to happen unless the work is there, you know? Unless the... Um, uh, you know, the... Yeah, unless the work is... Uh, at a, a decent enough quality. Well, not even de- I can't. I can't even talk right now. It's too late. But <laughs> uh, I'm about to fall asleep. But anyways, um, yeah. For me, I'm just trying to make the work as transcendent as possible. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, that's worked out. Like everything else, that's kind of related to having a business and you know um, having people appreciate the artwork and find out about the artwork that's all just come from having having the artwork there it's like i'm not even in control the the work the artwork does everything for me mm-hmm. so your job is to just make that the best as it possibly yeah. can be yeah the artwork yeah the the art does does everything i, I don't do anything basically <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the episode. If you're in Tokyo, you should definitely check out James Jean's exhibition at Murakami's Kai Kai Kiki Gallery. It's up until May 3rd. You can find out more about the show or listen to other episodes at hypebeast.com slash radio. Subscribe to us wherever you listen. I personally use Overcast. And you can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Jeff Staple. I love hearing your thoughts about the show. Check us out on the web at businessofhype.com and email any questions you might have to questions at businessofhype.com. The Business of Hype is directed by Daniel Novetta. It's edited and produced by Bright Young Things. You should check them out at byt.nyc. Engineering was done by Vincent Main. Our intern is Caroline Cow, and this was recorded at Sibling Rivalry Studio and on location in Los Angeles, California. I'm Jeff Staple. You've been listening to The Business of Hype on Hypebeast Radio.